Do you enjoy interactive author chats? Well, welcome to Story Behind the Story with Reese Ryan, where readers and authors connect. I'm Reese Ryan, author of sexy, emotional, grown folks romantic fiction set in small southern towns where characters find love while navigating career crisis and family drama. And today, my guest is indie author Raul Rilsey Adams, <laughs> who will be joining us to chat and we'll learn a little bit more about her. We'll find out how she started writing erotic romance and ask her about some things she wish she'd known back when she first started. So before we get started, thank you for so much for joining us and welcome to the show. And if you are new here, welcome. <laughs> if you've been here before, you know that it's a very interactive show. Thank you for being here with us. So we invite your questions comments in the chat we'll address them as we have time and um as always i'd appreciate it if you like subscribe and share the show that helps other readers to find it as well and if you're watching the show from facebook and you'd like to be a part of the discussion don't forget to scroll down to the bottom of the show description and you will see a link to StreamYard where you can give StreamYard permission to see your Facebook profile pic as well as your name so that we'll know who we're talking to in the conversation if you're uh, if you wanting to join it, the conversation. Um, and you just need to have done that recently. So if you've done it in the past, you should be fine. If you've never done it before, you want to click that link and give StreamYard permission to let us see who you are. And as you probably already know, you can catch the show during the season on the first and third Tuesdays of the month at 7 p.m. Eastern. Or, of course, you can watch the replay on YouTube at your convenience. However, Story Behind the Story with Reese Ryan is also now a podcast. So you can listen to the show um, on Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, or wherever it is that you like to listen to your favorite podcast. So don't forget to subscribe to us there as well. So enough of that. <laughs> and on with the show. So welcome to my guest, Rosie Adams. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm, I'm here. Thank you so much for having me. I am so, so, so grateful to have you and to be able to, to chat with you here. I know I've been harassing you forever about it <laughs> to make sure that we uh, got you on the show and got a chance to chat. So um, I'm just going to go right into it for anybody who is not familiar with you. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what it is that you write. Okay, so I am a 33-year-old attorney by day, writer and reader of romance by night. Um, I live on the Caribbean island of Antigua, um, where it's always very, very hot. <laughs> um, I'm a dog mom of two dogs, and I'm obsessed with coffee, sushi, Prosecco, The Sims, and recently um, playing Pokemon on my Switch. <laughs> Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I can just imagine how warm it is. Where's the temperature there today? Um, I have no idea. I, I know it's very, very hot. Like I was speaking with my boyfriend just before I started and I was saying to him, I'm going to do something really, really horrible because there's AC in my bedroom, but not in the office. And I'm just going to leave all the doors open to see if it helps. <laughs> and I did need that we're supposed to be having some sort of heat wave. Um, I don't know how it is right now, but it, it is quite, <laughs> quite hot. Yikes, yikes. It's warm. Here. I'm in North Carolina. It's, it's warm here today. It was like it was 85 or something. But um, yeah. And I just came from the beach and it was not very warm there. <laughs> so... <laughs> it was kind of chilly, but, you know, we enjoyed it just the same. So uh, so tell us a little bit about how it is that you got started writing romantic fiction. And um, first of all, tell us, when did you know that you wanted to start writing romantic fiction and then how you got started? Um, 
With romantic fiction, I think it came a little bit later on. So I, I've been writing since I was very young. I'm going to say five or six. And it was because I wanted to draw. I tell people the story all the time. I had a cousin who was a very good artist. And she would draw the most beautiful photos. And then I would try to do it. And I couldn't even get stickmen right. And I was very, very um, sad about it because, you know, when you're younger, all your books have photos. And I think even then I was quite intrigued with telling stories, but I thought that I needed the drawings to do them. And my mom pulled me aside one day and she showed me, I think it may have been a Sidney Sheldon novel. She had me go through and she said, do you know if it's something like there are no photos here? Like he tells the stories just with words. And then I thought, huh, well, I can do that too. And so I started writing random little stories that <laughs> I wish I had them now because I'm pretty sure they made no sense. <laughs> um, fantasy I wrote fantasy for quite a while um, throughout my teens and then I realized maybe at about 15 that I only read romance like I would read the fantasy novels once in a while which is weird because that's what I was writing but I was stealing Eric Jerome Dickey I was having my cousin's Silhouette and Harlequin books under my pillow. I only read romance. And when I had a good day, I wanted to read romance. When I had a bad day, I wanted to read romance. And I thought, well, maybe this is what I, I should write. Um, and so I think I just started. I, I would say that maybe at 15, 14, 15, I was writing like YA version of romance. I used to sit... At school, we used to have like chess next to each other, and I used to like give pages to my seatmate every day. And then at about 17, I think I started writing romantic fiction proper. And here we are. Wow, that's, that's funny. I, I remember like, being in middle school and, and writing stories and handing them to the person who was sitting yeah. next to me on the school bus. <laughs> so. <laughs> I had a folder by the time I got to, um, I guess it would be the 12th grade equivalent. I had a folder and I would get to school in the morning with new chapters and I'd give it to one person and it just circulate. Until yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I remember, I, I think I read my first Eric Jerome Dickey when I was about 12. And I think I was 12. It was Milk in My Coffee. And um, I remember being so scandalized. <laughs> <laughs> I had to confess to my mother like I felt like if I would not know peace unless I let her know <laughs> she's, been very, she's like there are adult things in these books these are things that you're not meant to be concerned about at all but read go ahead like read whatever you're, you'll get your hands on but read <laughs> like yeah. that yeah I but, love that she encouraged you to just keep reading because it was so important for you to be a reader, you know? <laughs> I had to meet him about four or five times. And I remember the first time that I met him, I said, when I read Milk in, in my coffee when I was 12, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Wait, how did you even get your hands on uh, that book? And I think it was just the privilege of having older cousins who read a lot and didn't know to put certain things away. So I always had a um, stream. I love that. I love it. So that's how you got started really writing all those things, you know, fantasy and, and then romantic fiction. So when did you shift from, you know, writing it sort of for pleasure or a hobby to saying, I want to, to write, be, to be a professional writer? And how did that process look? I feel as if I love telling stories. It's when I'm my happiest. I say to people that my worst day as an author feels better than my best day as a lawyer. Wow. And I remember that we, definitely before I finished high school, I said, I want to write. 
And everyone said to me, do you also want to eat? <laughs> Because, <laughs> they reminded me that publishing was not easy. Um, back, in the, back in those days, traditional publishing was really your only avenue. And um, so they said to me, you better have like a backup plan upon a backup plan because um, you're going to need some, you need, you're going to need to do something. And I remember everyone had said, well, you should be a journalist because if you like to write, you're going to like to write articles. And I said, probably not. I feel as if that would have the opposite effect. And I decided on law because John Grisham was a lawyer. And I'm like, well, he made those two things work. So maybe I could too. And <laughs> then I moved away from that. I wanted to do psychology. Eventually, I, I thought that I liked the idea of psychology, but it required statistics. And I suck at math. And so I said, well, we'll see how the law thing works. And so I think that I always had it in my mind that I wanted to at least be able to reach people in the very least. I'd gotten to the stage where I said to myself, well, this is probably never going to be a full-time career. This is probably never going to be a career at all. And um, that's one of the reasons why when I realized that I could self-publish, I thought, ooh, this makes sense. Because it would mean that I would have no deadlines that I did not set. And that would work very well with a legal career. Because I would not have to go, oh my goodness, I may have this case. and I also have a publishing deadline. And so I went for it and I really didn't expect much. I definitely did not expect this, um, but it's been a really beautiful journey. Wow. <laughs> so when did you publish your first, uh, not your first romantic fiction as an author? In 2014. Okay. I have a long blog post about that, um, actually. Because that is a book that I've since unpublished. Um, so you will see it on my, um, I don't know why, we, we only have an hour and let's get really long. You'll see it on my Goodreads if you go on my Goodreads. But I unpublished that, I think, in 2017, um, just before I published a book that I consider to be my first um, actual book, No, which is The Gift. And okay. um, let me see if I can like say it very succinctly, like really, really short. So remember I mentioned like really, like earlier I read Eric Jerome Dickey mm -hmm. and a lot of my, but I feel as if he was probably one of the very few persons that I read that had only um, black characters. I lived on Harley Quinn. I lived on Silhouette. And uh, The Gift is ironically a story that I, that was the story that was in that folder at school um, when I was handing it around and sending it around. And I made a decision that I know there were several factors for it. It was, I've read a lot of white romance novels. Where is this going to fit? And I published a book that had white leaves. And then I felt uncomfortable. But then it was there. It was my first book. And I said, yeah, this is not happening again. And so then we moved with the gift and we moved forward. And then I thought, nah, like this needs to come down. And I need to write about it. And so I blogged about it. And I feel as if it was something that I needed to grow. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that I needed to, I guess, allow me to come to a space where I realized that even if you don't think there is space for your stories, there always will be. And there's such a mammoth space um, in this community. And I think one of the most beautiful things about self-publishing is that it allowed such a vast array of uh, stories that traditional publishing may have otherwise kept out. 
to the point that my Kindle is filled with romance novels that are 99% Black. Um, it's not a circumstance where I'm like, oh, well, let me pick up one because they're all I see. When I go on Amazon, because of my previous purchases, it's all um, that I see. So yeah, first book was published in 2014. I've taken the immense life lesson that I learned with it and I've moved. And I think that the gift was my rebirth and my, my true calling and maybe one of my favorite books. Um, so that is the one um, that I want to claim. I love it. I love it. So that first one was more like you felt like this is what I've been seeing and this is what I need to publish. And then no, you the kind first of one was Listen Girl, you should have known better. <laughs> 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 that was wrong. Um, it's the kind of thing when you look back at yourself and you're like, child, you deserve an ass thing, but we're gonna love you with grace and we're gonna love you. With grace. <laughs> I love it, I love it. So when you were getting started, you know, as an off and again. In, in the, the indie space has been so wonderful because, like you said, it's put uh, so many or made space for so many stories that, you know, previously publishing, the publishing industry was a gatekeeper and, and saying, okay, well, we don't know how to market these stories or there's no, no space for these stories or no one's going to buy these stories. And indie authors have proved them wrong again and again and again. And to the point that now in a lot of ways, I feel like they're following indie authors as opposed to, you know, they're trying to kind of uh, uh, adopt what indie is doing in a lot of um, circumstances. Um, so that's very interesting. So it definitely gave you, so you gave you the space and the confidence to say, Hey, I can, I can do this because I can indie publish it. And that's, that's great. Um, yeah. And before, so on that point, I mentioned like, if I can interject, like, I think a very pivotal moment for me was I was randomly on Instagram, I think, one one day. Um, and Girl Have You Read was in my Explore page. And I think this is how Jasmine felt when she stepped onto that carpet, because she was like, oh my God. And um, then I, I remember like pulling all my friends and like, hey, look at this, like, look at this and look at this. And um, that was a pivotal moment. Yeah, I, I I love Girl Have You Read, and, and for anybody who's not familiar with it, it definitely uh, gives you news about all of these amazing Black romances that are available um, uh, by different by um, Black authors. So it has those lists of you know books, and it announces them through via social media, Twitter and Instagram and stuff like that. And then there's a website as well where Black authors can go and, and submit their books and what have you. Um, so it absolutely is a great space, especially for somebody who, you know, is saying, well, I don't know where to find Black Rover. I, I can't imagine somebody saying that these days, <laughs> but you definitely put the spotlight time. on, um, you know, because I feel at this point, if you're saying that, you're just not looking hard enough because we, we out you. <laughs> I don't even think it's about not looking hard enough. I think at this point, if you're saying it, you're closing your eyes to it. You're not looking at all. It's not a circumstance where you're trying to find and you, and you can't. It's a circumstance that you're just not looking. Yeah, totally agree. But absolutely still, I feel, you know, Grow Your Red absolutely still gives us you know, it's wonderful that it is highlighting all these amazing Black romances, um, you know, that, that are coming out. And I appreciate so much the work that they're doing there. So, uh, and let me see, let me just really quickly kind of go back through some of these comments and stuff. Uh, author D.L. White says she's so excited to see Rilzy. <laughs> me too, me too, D.L. And uh, Veronica says, good evening. Jennifer Copeland as well. We have a Facebook user who says, hey, y'all, we can't see who you are. So if you uh, want to make sure that you we can see your name and stuff, just scroll down to the bottom of the description and give StreamYard permission to see your, your Facebook information. Um, 
read love listen says good evening everyone and when you were talking about having a reading eric Jerome dickey at 12 jennifer copeland says i was reading the old harlequin and silhouette desire books when i was eight <laughs> and i was reading daniel still when i was 11 i love that <laughs> Uh, and our Facebook user says, my mama tried to get me to go into journalism. I took one college class and then nope. <laughs> so everything ain't for everybody, right? Um, and he says, oh my God, so glad I made it. We're so glad you made it too. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today. And Pam Kelly says, hello from Houston. Happy to be introduced to Rosie. You you are in for a treat then, Miss Pam Kelly. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> and Facebook user says, yep, being an indie author is awesome. Definitely is super nice to have that complete control now, isn't it? That's really, <laughs> that's really nice. So um, let's go on to the, to the next part of the, my next question for you regarding your career. And that is, so once you decided, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to indie publish these things. What are some of the challenges that you face once you decided you were serious about becoming an author? So I have really bad imposter syndrome. And I think it infects every single aspect <laughs> of my life. And... Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges I have faced and I continue to face is just getting out of my head. I'm just doing the thing and not being paralyzed by fear. Slow steps. <laughs> We're taking really yeah. slow steps. But I think some other challenges have been finding time. Or, I mean, I guess in the spirit of be honest with yourself, taking the time um because sometimes it's not about finding it it's it's about having that discipline to take it and a third one is just i can be very haphazard so i'm a mood reader and i never thought that i'd also be a mood writer <laughs> and, um, and that has become um quite problematic i guess when you get to the part of some of the things I wish I'd known when I started, um, I would speak a little bit more about that. But logically, I know that discipline breeds motivation and not the other way around. Mm. But I still find myself very, very often waiting on that motivation. And I've spent so long saying things like, well, my muse is not playing with me right now, or um, these characters don't want to speak, and stuff like that, that I feel as if I have not appreciated or paid enough attention to, if these characters don't want to speak, you're going to sit them down, you're going to tell them, listen up, <laughs> um, from 5 to 6 a.m. every morning, we will do some talking, whether you want to or not. Right. Um, so, so that has been... Um, and also, the idea of being in charge of everything um, gets a bit overwhelming. Um, I suck at marketing. Horrible. Like, if you could give, like, negative grades um, for <laughs> marketing, I would get them. <laughs> I'm always just so excited about the process of writing and then getting it out. And then I remember, oh, well, people, people have to know. Um, that that if you look at any of my media pages, well, don't because it's embarrassing. <laughs> like, <they're just> like, <laughs> <laughs> it has been a steep learning curve, and a lot of the times I feel as if I'm really not over it. I'm I'm here, um, just just moving, but um, not with any strict. Um, I don't want to say purpose, but not with any strict map which I'm coming to realize is very necessary. Indeed. <laughs> so you said so many important things there. Um, first, Jennifer says, Rosie, I have a few of your books and I enjoyed them. Um, but you, you said so many important things. I think that, um, and that's definitely, a lot of those lessons are definitely things that I have struggled with or continue to struggle with as well. Um, you talked about, uh, imposter syndrome, and that's a real thing. 
And it's definitely something that I have struggled with in the, in the past and continue to struggle with, you know, <laughs> you get better over time. Um, but there's just, you know, I, I feel like with every book, I have these moments where I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, you know what I'm saying? Or this is terrible. And then at some point, like I get done and I'll read it back. And I'm like, oh, this, this is good. <laughs> you know, so you, but you every time I still have those moments where I feel like, you know, I don't know if I can do this. Um, but what you said about discipline breathes motivation, not the other way around. Oh, that's some that is powerful for any writer, but especially if somebody is just starting out. And you talk too about, you know, how is more, you know, we were saying about finding time, but it's more about the discipline because, you you know, a lot of times you have the time you just choose to do, it's what you choose to do with it, right? So those are lessons that definitely, it took me a long time to learn. As an author, there's so many lessons that I continue to still learn. Actually, one of the things I have written in my planner is I have a list of things that work for me. And it's just kind of a reminder to myself because a lot of times I'll do something. And I'm like, oh, okay, this worked really well, but I won't do it the next time. You know, <laughs> I, I just, I still try to reinvent the wheel every time. And so like, I have this list now to remind myself, okay, these are the things that work. Stop trying to, stop trying to take shortcuts and do it some other kind of way. Cause it always ends up taking longer or making it harder. So those are such great lessons that you shared in terms of, of challenges that you had to face in, in your career at the start and, and um, how you've kind of um, overcome them. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, the next question, oh, let me, look, let, me, hold on, let me look at our comments. Okay. Veronica says, Daniel still is a favor for me. I love Kaleidoscope and Zoya. And Paulette, as do you hire out promotion? How do you make yourself, I assume, do it? Because <laughs> marketing, like you said about for most authors, it's just like those commercials. It reminds me of those commercials um, where the business owner, I think, I think it's for like a tax um, product or something and or a, a financial product. And so the business owner talks about how they're, you know, they know they're great at whatever it is they do, whether they're a wood maker or what, you know, a furniture maker or whatever, but it's the business part of the business that they, they're not so good at. And so it can be the same thing with authors, especially, especially as an indie author, as you said, you are in control of everything, which means you need to know a little bit about everything. Even if you're hiring somebody out, you need to know something about a lot of those things. And that it can be overwhelming. And that was one of the reasons why, even though from the beginning of my career, I knew I wanted to be completely hybrid, but I was so hesitant. I was so overwhelmed by the idea of all the things you need to know mm -hmm. as an indie author, all of the skills you have to have and, and the things you have to do like marketing <laughs> and all of that kind of stuff that, that was kind of scary to me. Um, and Jessica Terry says, the marketing certainly isn't my favorite part either. So yeah, it's, it's for a, a lot of <laughs> authors. It's one of those things, whether it's that or the, the, you know, the numbers part of it or whatever it is that can be a challenge. And you're like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so the next thing I wanted to ask you is then, given some of the things we talked about, what are three things that you wish you'd known at the beginning of your career as an author? And what would you do differently? Okay, so we're, we're gonna piggyback on that discipline breeds motivation, not motivation breeds discipline bit. Although I think generally where creative careers are concerned, we're taught that you go by mood. Like you, you go when the inspiration strikes, you go when your muse is playing with you, and I would break away from that earlier <laughs> um, because I'm trying now, but it's so ingrained. I would break away from the idea that I can't make myself show up, sit down and write for two hours, even if tomorrow I'm going to have to get rid of half of that stuff because it's creative and you go according to your mood. Because if I had legal submissions that were due in a week, I can't say but yeah, you see what had happened was I did not feel like <laughs> I 
I wouldn't think of that. It sounds so ludicrous to me um, to even think of that. But there have been so many days that I'm supposed to go up to my office to write and I play Pokemon instead or I scroll on TikTok instead because I say, well, I, I, I'm not in the mood. I, I don't feel the inspiration. And then I realize that my imposter syndrome thrived in those circumstances because it's always there going, well, I mean, even like every time you say in your writing career, I went, I'm not even, you realize that because in my head, I'm still like, I mean, <laughs> do I have a writing career? <laughs> I don't like being a little bit extra here. Um, and so it breathes into this, well, you need to be in the mood, but you're never going to if you don't think that you should be taking up space and you don't think that you should be here. And it's a vicious cycle. And that's the cycle that I've been in for the last year and a half now, if I'm going to be honest. Um, so that was the one thing that I would do differently. I would say, this is a job. It may not be your full-time job, your half-time job, <laughs> your quarter-time job, but this is your job. And if you did not show up to your day job, you would get fired. <laughs> um, there would be penalties. So you're going to pick your working hours. It doesn't have to be 10 hours per day. It can be 45 minutes per day, but you will pick your office hours and you'll show up. Even if you get one chapter or no chapters, even if you get three chapters that will not make it in the end, you're going to clock in every day because this is what you, you do. And so that, that's definitely the first thing. Um, and... The second bit, the second thing I think that I would have done differently is writing. <laughs> um, I have so much pleasure, I, I take so much pleasure from writing and I always get very, very excited. And I realized that I had no cohesive theme <laughs> or anything like about what I write. Um, I'm, I'm just literally going where the story would take me. And I think that a bit earlier on, I would consider what I wanted my brand to be. Um, but I think right now I'm just leaning into the fact that my brand is chaos. And um, we're just going <laughs> to like that. Like, <laughs> um, but I think I, I, I may have taken more time to try to establish what I want my brand to be. Because for example, I didn't, I don't, I don't know that I started off writing erotica. And I don't know that I realized when my writing became erotica. Um, I I don't know when that shift happened. I one of my friends said that if you read my Falling Like a Johnson series, um, and that has six books, they just got spicier and spicier and spicier and spicier. <laughs> and then you got to the fifth book and you're like, one second, <laughs> what exactly is going on there? It was not, uh, it wasn't a conscious, I'm sorry, my neighborhood has a lot of dogs and they're always excited about. Oh, no worries. <laughs> um, um, there was no conscious shift. There was nothing. I, I, I just, I go according to the wind. <laughs> And I feel as if, even though I'm trying to embrace that now, I'm embracing it because I think it's kind of too late to read it. <laughs> but if I could go back to the start, I'd have a clear idea on, um, on what I wanted my brand to be. And uh, the third bit is going to sound very, very fruitful, but I think it's very, very necessary. I think I've said in interviews in the past that I often feel like a kid that has just gotten into a club and I'm just looking around and I'm just very happy to be here. Like, I don't, like, I don't care about the music. I don't care about what I'm drinking. I don't care about what I'm wearing. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> that was great at the start, but it's been several years now. And I feel as if that whole idea that, wow, I'm just happy to be here has hindered growth. It has hindered me like trying to take up space because I've spent a lot of time just being 
very grateful that I was allowed any space at all. Um, and whereas that's not like a practical tip, I feel as if I could go back to the start, I would say to myself, look, I know that you were just writing books because you're compelled to write and you'd have been happy to reach anybody at all. And you're now in a position where you've reached more persons than you, than you thought would have ever happened. Be giddy for a while and then get down to business before you don't reach anyone at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have um, instilled that in me in, in the beginning and make it a priority. I think that's more in line with number one. Treat it as your job. Even if it's not your full-time job, you treat it as your job. You bring the same level of discipline and that's the only way that you're going to grow. Yeah. And plot. <laughs> you know, I am with you there because I also in the beginning was not a plotter. I imagined myself to be a pantser, but I kept not finishing stories. And, it, you know, I, that's how I finished the first one. Even though I didn't plot the entire thing, it was like the part where I was stuck. I was like, like let me just at least plot that. And that, I finished that. And so sometimes during your career, for sure, you need to continue to reassess. I fly by the seat of my pants. I think pantsing has worked out very well for me. I have never plotted a book. Um, <laughs> I, I've, I've not plotted. And uh, there have been circumstances where I've been writing, 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 and I hit a block. And I go, oh, well, I'm going to just like dash everything else and I'll start over again um, from a different way um, before sitting down and actually trying to plot. But I feel as if earlier on, I should have made an effort to try. And then I'd have been able to say, well, maybe it's not for me. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I can pass my way through some things and I can plot my way through. through a I think the broader thing is use all of the tools in your toolbox. Yes. Stop being partial to certain things and making certain things your identity. Because when that fails, you have a problem. And so now every time I think, well, maybe you should learn to plot, it feels overwhelming <laughs> because it feels like this thing that I've just never, I've never done before. So yeah. I would find that to say, I would use all the tools in, in my toolbox and, and then also try to buy new things. Like always, as you said, reassess because that becomes necessary. Yeah. What you said about that, it becoming your identity, that's definitely why I was so against trying to plot in the beginning is, I don't know, I, I don't know why I felt like it was, I don't know if I felt like it was just some kind of virtue to just being a person who just was a pantser and, you know, flew by the seat of my pants and did not try to do any kind of plotting. But I don't know, I just, I kept resisting this idea of creating or doing any kind of plotting and outlining. And once I kind of said, okay, what you're doing is not working. <laughs> so it's time to try some other tools in the toolbox. That's when I discovered, okay, I don't want to, I don't need to, to plot to the level some other people do, but I do need to have some sort of framework. That's my process. I need to have some sort of framework. Now, once I create that framework, me and the characters, especially the characters, they might take me in a totally different direction and that's okay. And that's part of my process too. <laughs> so. I, I think maybe for me, I could never embrace that part of it. I thought that once you plotted it, you plotted it and that was the end. And that was why I was so resistant to yeah. trying to put anything down. But yeah, the idea that you can just put something down for reference just so you have an idea because I still think that pants thing is it's fun. It's definitely fun. It's great not knowing like where you're ending up. Like you're sitting down and you're like, well, <laughs> I guess we'll see. Um, when my alpha reader would say, oh, I didn't see that coming. And I'd be like, neither did I. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, fun, huh? but even if it does work, I can't help but think if you at least do a hybrid, it'll at least help you write more quickly. Yeah, effectively. Um, exactly. So it's a goal for 2024. 
Nice. I've been saying that for the last four years. So really yeah. <laughs> and, and what you just said too, that's part of the reason too, because especially, you know, for the past few years, I have been producing so much. And so like, I, I feel like, especially if you, for me, if I knew, knew if I wanted to be as prolific as I wanted it to be, then I needed to have more of a handle on what the story was going to be about when I sat down to write so that every time I'm sitting down, I'm not kind of like reaching and trying to figure out <laughs> what's happening. And uh, that also, for me, also spoke to the idea of like, like you were saying before about feeling like, okay, we're supposed to be led by our muse and you feel like, oh, your muse is not talking to you or whatever. I would, when I have at least know, even if I don't know the entire book, if I know, okay, this is the scene that I want to write or something, have something in mind when I sit down, I'm much more likely to have a very productive writing day than if I just sit down and look at a blank screen. So that's just something that's I learned true. about myself. That's true. So we have a few comments that I want to address before I ask another question. And thank you for sharing those, those insights that you had about yourself and your career. They're very helpful and enlightening to me, but also uh, several other folks. Um, first, Miss WOC Reader. Hello. We're glad you made it, too. <laughs> so thanks. Um, and um, please forgive me if I'm portraying your name is <laughs> Lunashi. Thank you so much. I really needed to hear these three things. I've been attempting to write and be consistent. So hearing you gives me more motivation to continue. I love that. That really and truly makes my day. Uh, Jessica Terry says, plotting is key for me, even if it veers, and it usually does, <laughs> at least I have some kind of a roadmap. That's the same for, for me, Jessica. It's like, I look at it just like, you know, it's like kind of the walls, you know, and inside I can play and do whatever, but I just need some sort of foundation to start with. Um, you know, even when I'm writing for my publisher, you know, the proposals that I submit to them, you know, a third to a half of that stuff is not going to happen, or more things might happen. <laughs> it's just, that's the way it's going to go. It's just, it's just a suggestion, you know, basically. <laughs> but that helps me a lot to have some sort of idea of what's supposed to be happening. Um, and then we have the other side. Uh, okay. Author Kimalisa Mings says, the funny thing is I feel like plotting has slowed me down. And I've heard with some authors, they say that um, I've had a lot of people say that they are not motivated when they plot because they feel like they already know what's happening in the story and then they're not excited to write it. So it just, it really is like you were saying, Rosie, about, you know, using all the tools in your toolbox, you know, to just try, I feel like trying different things is important because until you try it, you don't know if you're going to like it or, or not, but never ever feel, I don't care who said it. I don't care what a bestseller they are or how respected they are. You, nobody's process that you look at it and say, oh, I'm going to do it just like she does it because it works for her. It's going to work for me. That's not true. But try That's pieces and parts and find out what works for you. I feel like it's the biggest danger for me with plotting is my favorite part of writing is the daydreaming thing. And I can see me spending six months plotting a book and then looking up and going, oh, I was supposed to write that. <laughs> um <laughs> But you're right, like you use everything that's available to you and you find the process that's best suited uniquely to you. For sure. Um, Veronica has a question for you. Rosie, she says, what's the best part about being an author? I just love the creation of stories. I feel as if, um, there's just so much possibility, like so many, you get to live lives that you probably will never get to live. Um, <laughs> you get to experience things in a way that you probably never get to experience. And I feel like with every book I've written, I get, I learn something new. Um, if it's about myself or the general like human condition or something that I've never allowed myself to think deeply before. And it's just fun. <laughs> um, I say it's kind of like 
when we were little and we played with our dolls or teddy bears and we had like all of these narratives and all of these stories I, I just grew up to do them without the dolls <laughs> and um, it's been it's, it's a really fun ride yeah it's it's super fun creating different worlds and you know creating the you know, create the world as you'd like it to be <laughs> or, or giving you know people who giving people happily ever after who you know maybe in you've seen in situations in the real world who didn't find theirs those are some of the things i like about being an author and also just the way it allows you to connect with other people um especially when they come to you and and you know, they feel like they they feel like they've connected in some way or that you got them in some way through a story that you've written. Those are some of the things that are exciting about being an author for me. So um, let's see. Another question. Uh, oh, going back to pants and Paulette says trying to get past pantsing need more organization to stop rewriting so many times. Uh, <laughs> That rewriting thing is no joke because uh, I, I know for me, I don't know. How about you? Do you, so, okay. Are you a person who goes through and writes your first draft and then goes back to, back and fixes it? Or do you fix as you write? Um, I think I fix maybe in thirds. So um, I'll write and then I'll go back. And then I will write and then I'll go back. Um, I did it about three times and then I will go over it all. Or like the book that I'm working on now, I'm 57,000 words in and I'm scrapping all of those to, um, to rewrite. <laughs> oh my God. My heart, my heart is hurting right now for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And sometimes it's just necessary you know, and yeah. it's so hard, but it always, it makes a better book, you know? Because if you feel like you need to do that, it makes a better book. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do think, yeah, yeah, I, I thought, I just got to a point and I went, oh, this is the story. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing <laughs> that surprising. Um, this is the story right here, so. <laughs> Do you not okay? And see, that's a good question. Do is is that something do, that happens more when you pants as opposed to outlining? Because like sometimes with panting, right, you're almost discovering the story as you go, right? So that's why you might hit a point in which you're like you're like, hey, here's the real story. All of that was nonsense, <laughs> you know. Now I've got to go and and change direction. So, but it can also make for some of the most exciting stories. Who knows? I, I don't know. There's definitely no wrong way or right way. It's just what works for you. And it's then, never been this bad for me before. Um, I've never gotten to nearly 60,000 words. And then I, I say, nah, like, nah, like I, I need to be telling it this way. Um, I am hoping that I'll be lucky and I'll be able to pull things. Lord, I hope, um, because whew, if not, um, but I've had several books where I've been writing and writing and then I, I go, oh, thank you for telling me that. And then I can go back and I can incorporate the things that I've gone along. But this is definitely the first time I've gone, yeah, nah. So. <laughs> wow. I, I have a feeling this is like going to be your best book yet. You know, it's, like, it's one of those books that it takes so much more work to get to the end. But in the it's, end, it, it's, 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 it's the best book. Yeah. Because thus far, my most popular book, um, Go Deep, that book was just a, well, I don't want to say it was a joke, but I was speaking with one of my friends and uh, and she said to me, well, she tweeted, I need to read like a friends to lovers trope. And so I tweeted at her with all of the books that I've written that had a friends to lovers trope. And she said, I really need, like, be serious. Like I've read these already. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'll write you one. <laughs> and I thought that I was joking. I mean, to be honest, I thought I was joking when I said it too. But then... <laughs> Maybe a few hours later, I said, well, what if I did? And uh, and so I did. 
I went on Pinterest and I got two character names. I bought a book cover and didn't change the name. I it was just like, please put my name on the bottom of this. And then I took one scene out of the book that I was actually supposed to be writing at that time. And, and I just wrote it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you just never know how a book's gonna come together, right? <laughs> yeah. And I keep I going, it. and I kept going, I don't understand. <laughs> 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 wow you just never know how like, you just never know how a story's gonna come together or you know how it's gonna happen like you, you were talking about marketing and all that kind of stuff or in terms of what's gonna happen what, what's gonna be the book that blows up you just don't know right all you can do is just do your best <laughs> and keep working at it and hope but my god that's that's something that's interesting um, another question we have is from Veronica Lockett. What would fans be most surprised to learn about you? I always hate questions like that because I'm like, I'm boring. There's no, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> well, um, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I do have my childhood teddy bear still. <laughs> um, and up until three years ago, I took him everywhere with me. Oh, um, wow. I love it. <laughs> um, I, I have no idea. I, I think also because I feel as if I'm generally an open book. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I One of the things I was surprised to learn was, first of all, I didn't realize you live on an island, and then I didn't realize you were a lawyer. So oh. there's so many there are so many lawyers who are who are authors. We've had so many lawyers uh, <laughs> on who are authors. Um, okay, so tell us, let me see. So we were just talking earlier before we went on air, and you just mentioned Go Deep. That's been your um, most popular book, and I've read Go Deep and loved it. And so people might not know that also that there's a continuation of that book called Deeper, or those with those characters' story that's called Deeper. It's like an epilogue for it. And so tell me what you were telling us early me earlier about um, the availability of those books on. Say it again for me. Book, uh, book parlay. parlay. Book parlay. Yes. Yeah, so as of, I want to say it may have been last week. I have been well, so I've been off of social media up until I realized that I really needed to at least <laughs> put up something about this chat. Um, but Go Deep and Deeper, they're now available in audiobook format. Um, they, it's, they've been narrated by Jishani Michael and Winston James. And they are available for sale on bookparlay.com. Deeper is free, um, but Go Deep is priced at $10. And in two to three weeks, they'll be available on Audible. Okay, I just put the link for Book Parlay um, up there for anybody who, like me, had not heard of Book Parlay before. <laughs> so I just dropped the link um, in the chat for that, and that's for Go Deep and then Deeper, which is like the epilogue of, of uh, Go Deep. Um, and if, for instance, if there was a person who was brand new to you and they were wondering which one of your books they should read, which book would you direct someone to who was new to you? So it depends on um, your steam level, but if your steam level is very low, you're you're going to you're not going to get very far in the catalog. Um, <laughs> if you have a low steam level, I would recommend the gift. Um, you might cry, I cried, um, but. I will start you off there. But if you have a high steam level, I always recommend birthday shot to person. Um, Say that again. Birthday shot. Got it. Okay. It is, the trope is friends to lovers. 
brother's best friend. Some of my faves. And <laughs> is Stefan Antigo. And it is set around the lead characters. I think it was her 30th birthday. Her best friend encouraged her to shoot her birthday shot um, at the lead male character. And I had a lot of fun writing that. And I think it's one of my steamier books. It's not the steamiest, but I think it's one of the steamier ones. And I would recommend Go Deep as well. I had a lot of fun with Go Deep. I would warn you that the second book in that series is completely different. And in tone, in length, in everything, it, it, they don't seem as if they belong in the same series. Um, and that one will devastate you. But you can start off with um, Go Deep. But if it's one book I would recommend and your steam level is up there, it definitely would be Birthday Shot because I think it was quite fun. Okay. And Monique says, love that book. So I love that. Um, excellent. Excellent. So before we do our recs, which we're going to do in a minute, um, Jessica Terry asks, do you still play Sims? Okay. And then says, do you, does it ever spark any story ideas for you? No, because weirdly, Jessica, you're going to be so embarrassed for me. I, I play The Sims in the weirdest way. I create a household, I create a single Sim, and I make her an author. <laughs> I have her write books until she has so much money, it's boring. And then she lives a life like trying to max out all of the skills. I don't know why. I feel as if I should try to use The Sims for story ideas because I also watch a lot of videos of people playing The Sims and the storylines are always really interesting. But when it comes down to it, it's just me and this one Sim in an apartment writing books. Every <laughs> often, um, they may have a farm. Um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey whatever it takes and then sometimes you just need to do something that's totally unrelated to writing to just give your mind a break right so whatever it takes to relax you and, and do that <laughs> so okay so now on to the recs so um, what? who are some of your go to indie authors who write steamy engaging stories that you'd wreck to other uh, readers who might not be as familiar with some indie authors especially okay so I always recommend Christina Jones um, because I read her a lot so one of her books is actually my comfort book and, <laughs> and um, whenever it is that I am sitting down and uh, my best friend would say to me, because we have this thing going where we're trying to read for as many days as possible. And when we're having uh, the conversation about what are you reading right now? And I tell her that I am reading Wanda. She goes, oh, okay. So what's happening in your life? <laughs> That's interesting. Wow. And it's your comfort read. I love that. Dopian wants. I don't understand why exactly. Um, it, it's not like one of the, you know, the, the lovely, well, I mean, it's a romance, but it's not like set in, uh, in happy times. It's dystopian. But for some reason, I go back to that a lot. I'm currently also quite enjoying A.H. Cunningham. Um, Plie really did something to me. <laughs> um, it was really, really good um, to the point that I did send it to at least two of my friends. So I was like, and we can, we can sit down and we can have a conversation about how you actually feel about about this book because I enjoyed it so much. 
I love that. Um, in terms of engaging, like not always like the spiciest, but engaging, I do also enjoy ghee rose quite a bit. Um, I have been uh, very, very close. I, that, what's it called? When, the, when you buy your tokens that Amazon is trying to do, it's, I do not remember what it's called. Um, when you're reading like chapter by chapter. Oh yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, oh. What is that called? I forget. Oh, you mean on Am it's on Amazon where you do the tokens and uh. Yeah, it's whatever what it's called. It called? Like I, I have remember. a policy of never saying to someone, "Hey, like when are you going to upload the thing or update the thing or like where's that next installment?" But I've been spending a lot of time like really trying to resist. <laughs> Actually, going. <laughs> about that, right? The checking. How many did you tell me? You said I had as many, or was it three? No, how many ever you want to you want to share? Okay. Um. Because you've named some great ones, of course. CCJ, we could always start with that. Who was CCJ? Thank you. It's Kindle Bella. It's Kindle Bella with the token. Emma's Kindle Bella, okay. Yeah, I'm assuming, yeah. uh, embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I, I've definitely come across some great stories on Kindle Bella, and I kind of forgot about it. Just like you said, you forgot the name. I completely forgot about it. I was in a mood where I was reading a bunch of Kindle Bella stories, and they were fantastic, actually. But I just had kind of got away from it. I don't have the patience. I realize that's also why I don't watch TV very much. Well, I guess like on Netflix when they release everything at once, that's really good. But I just realized that I don't like having to wait for things. So the chapter by chapter thing is my idea of actual hell. And uh, <laughs> So I, I used to do that on Patreon a lot. Um, Nicole Falls had this book on Patreon and I think she'd been going for like a really long time only to be very surprised when I said to her, I didn't read a single one of the installments as they were going out on Patreon. I actually just waited for the book. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, the patience level is not there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, you just mentioned Nicole Falls too, and that that's somebody who I would definitely wreck as a uh, indie author, or black indie yeah. author who writes amazing uh, <laughs> stories, amazing fun stories that are sexy. Um, you said CCJ Alexandria House. Oh my god! Um, I think she's still here. Um, she had me from, is it Brunch at Ruby? Was it Brunch yes. At Ruby? Yeah. <laughs> one. Yes, um, we love her. We I, love you. I've also... Alexandra Warren. Love Belvin. Um, I'm just thinking, trying to... Oh, Jody Slaughter. Uh, who else? Business, business Tasha Bishop as well. I'm not sure if I want to say Daniel Ellen. I don't know if I said that Daniel Ellen, but also Daniel Ellen. She has some amazing stories as well. So just a lot of folks to uh, Tay Russ, um, Asia, just so many people. <laughs> Like it's like you were saying earlier, it's there's no shortage, and it's, they're not hard to find at all, <laughs> not not at all. And for readers, um, oh, hello, hello, Miss Alice, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, for readers, if you have some favorite indie authors that you want to drop in the, the chat you are welcome to do that as well because we always love to contribute to people's busting people's TBRs here so <laughs> there are so many great authors doing hot 
sexy, just smart stories that are are so much fun um, to read. Uh, and I just I I just love discovering a new author. But then there's always that thing you discuss. And I just saw a a meme about this on Instagram today about like you know discovering a new author and then you're like you got to go find all their backlist and stuff <laughs> it's like <laughs> so it's always fun to me to discover a new author that I have not read before and to to then uh, discover all the books that they have that are out there um hey there Miss Loretta this is Colette R. Harrell um and there's just like, I feel like there's like 15 other people who are going to start popping in my head as soon as we go off the <laughs> air. So, <laughs> and of course that will probably happen. Um, and then AJ Locke, if you like fantasy romance, she has an erotic novella called Elemental Inferno that's free right now. Thank you for sharing that. That sounds fun. That sounds interesting and fun. <laughs> so I like, I would like that. Oh, uh, yes. Very good. Jessica Terry says she, Sanders, Mika James. I love, love, love. Uh, I think it's Being Hospitable by Mika. Um, Andrea Anderson. Uh, Paulette suggests Monica Walters and Angie Saunders. I'm interested. I'm excited to hear some names that I had not heard before. Um, Tay Monet, Talena Tillman, Kimberly Brown, Brian Denae. So there's a ton of authors out there who are in the indie space. Um, and by all means, and that was one of the great discussions that uh, DL, when DL White was here, uh, we talked about, you know, different ways to support indie authors and stuff. And so, Definitely, if you want to see some interesting stories where you can, you know, they have some more freedom to do things that a lot of times maybe in traditional publishing you can't. Indie is a great space to get into. And, you know, the authors who are out there are doing any stories right now. They're just doing so many amazing stories, so much amazing work. I mean, and they have such huge catalogs. CCJ, Christina C. Jones, um, Alexander Warren. They just have so many books. <laughs> Alexander Warren, uh, Alexandria House. They have so many books in their backlist. Love Belvin. There's no shortage of, like, once you discover one of them, there's books for days that you can can go and read. Yeah, and that's Antoinette, 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 she named some great ones, too. Um Eva J. Brock, Miss Eva, Monica Walters, Mel Dow, Tay Russ, who we mentioned earlier. Uh, <laughs> no, you would not, Jessica. She said, would I be, it'd be too heady to name myself. No, it would not. Jessica Terry as well. So, um, and Miss Alice said, I like Monica Walters' story. So there's just so many, uh, many of them out there. Oh, yes. Thank you. And I also just suggest that, um, girl, have you right. If you just pop onto the Instagram page and you can go down as far back as you wish, you will definitely um, come across a lot. Yeah, that's a good point because, you know, it's not, you know, you can go, like you said, you can just keep going back and, and you'll find more and more uh, books and discover other authors. And, you know, even if you discover a book from there, backlist or whatever as you're going back you know they're gonna most of them have a ton of books uh that you can and did i not say kadrina did i not mention kadrina jackson you know it's just so so many authors out there iris bowling thank you uh miss loretta and there's a ton of them doing the bays of juneteenth series that are coming up you know sherelle right. sherelle yeah. green and you know L and just so many of them are going to be in this. Uh, so, yeah. And, you know, we've done um, topics up on this before. So it's a lot of these names aren't new. And so if you can, you go to some of the other uh, past shows, you'll see some of the other names that we, we've talked about. But yeah. And I'm, so I was, thank you. Yeah. For uh, mentioning Joan Vassar. So 
yeah, just so many wonderful authors that that um, if you have not read, you are missing out. It's just there's not enough time <laughs> to read all these authors. So, um, but definitely support indie authors, please, 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 please. There's so many amazing black indie authors, especially. So, um, and is I what I love too about indie authors and black indie authors, especially, is that you know like you were saying, Rosie, in the beginning, you know, how it was, you know, the idea of your family was like, hey, do you want to eat? It's going to be so hard <laughs> to get into this industry. And basically, you know, that these indie authors have given the publishing industry the finger and said, hey, we're going to go do this ourselves. We don't need you. <laughs> and we're going to find our own readers in our own space. And that's what folks like um, you know, all these CCJ and all these other amazing authors have done is said, hey, we don't need you. We're going to go find our own space, make our own space, find our own readers. And they're out here doing amazing things. Yeah. So it's well, very, well, very well, exciting well. to me. Yeah. It's exciting to me to read these authors and to support them, seeing what they're doing and helping to support that. So um, what were, were you going to just say something else? Oh, no, I was saying um, instead of waiting for a seat, they built their own table. And by doing so, definitely created seats for other people. I love that. Yeah. I love it. 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 Um, and that's right. It's Sharon, Sharon C. Cooper, even though she has some traditional stuff right now, she definitely has a ton of a backlist of indie projects as well. And Cheryl Lister has several indie um, books as well. So yeah, and I love it, I love it. Um, okay, I'm just, oh, thank you. Bailey West as well, that's another great one. Okay, so tell us, Rosie, what else can we expect from you in the near future? You have a little near. Um, <laughs> At some point this year, and yes, I, I'm aware that there's six months left in the year and I'm being really big, um, <laughs> I will publish a book. <laughs> um, no, but I, I have at least two books that I aim to publish by the end of the year. Um, one of them is uh, meant to be a friends to lovers quasi-accidental pregnancy trope um, called But as Friends Though. And um, it's been a ride. And the second one, I am very excited about because I have been, uh, several months ago, I was looking at some of my fantasy books and I realized that I created this fictional Caribbean island um, by the name of Providence. And I'd set a few... There was a point in time when I was varying from epic fantasy into urban fantasy, and I'd set a few urban fantasy books on Providence. And I realized that I quite liked the island. Um, it was nice. <laughs> I would live there, um, which is a plus. And I thought that I wanted to create a series set on um, Providence and leave some room for if I do want to see if I can do a paranormal romance set on that island as well. So I've been like reestablishing my familiarity with the lore and with the maps and, the, and, and like all of those kinds of things. So I'm hoping to introduce readers to Providence at some point in time um, this year, but definitely, but as friends though, and we'll see how the rest of the year plays out. Oh, so this one, this Providence one, would that be contemporary or would that be fantasy? It'll be contemporary romance. I'm just taking the island and I am, um, I'm just taking the island. The um, paranormal, like fantasy based aspects of it, I'll keep it. Like I'll have it in at least the back of my, my back pocket, so to speak. Um, because I did have one story that I was looking at and I thought, oh, this, 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 this could have been a thing. Um, but so, 
as it stands, it's just, I think I've so far plotted, well, not plotted, dreamed, uh, daydreamed about four books that I, I want to set on the island. But before that, there will also hopefully be How About Forever, which is the follow up or at least the true book to Just For Tonight, which was a New Year's book that was really fun. And last year I did the photo shoot um, for How About Forever. We had some really lovely photos, some really lovely photos. And then I just never wrote the book. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> That is something that I'm hoping at least towards the end of the year, I'll be able to, so that another new year has not passed um, with the, the follow on of the story of those two couples. And yeah, so, but as friends though, which I quite, so some, okay, so but as friends though, I'm not eight, which is a short book, which is also in audiobook format. So if you go to bookparlay.com, you will see eight there as well. That's the one at the private chef. Um, that was another one of those books where I was just bored and I was doing something else entirely. And I thought, I wonder what would happen if, and I wrote that. And that followed Tempest and her private chef for us. Very short. It was definitely a novelette. And that led into a novella called Love Scammed, where Russ and Kempeth tricked their best friend and cousin to go on a Valentine's Day holiday by telling them each that they were going away with them. And they didn't realize what was happening until they got to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> then there's a third book include, which features the third friend who's Win who is briefly mentioned in eight. In eight, she was the reason that Tempest was there alone because she was meant to have this private dinner with Wynn and Wynn, who is an OBGYN, was delivering babies and so she couldn't show up. And she was mentioned briefly in Love Scammed because she was trying to get Monet to not kill Tempest for what she had done. And Wynn gets her own book in But As Friends Still. And I really like Wynn. I really like Caleb. I don't know how they feel about me because they've been giving me more problems than they needed to have been. <laughs> but I'm actually quite excited um, for everyone to read it. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. You have, look, it's, the year is almost half over. I was just talking about this to Maz and while we were on vacation because we just got back from the beach. Um, and I can't believe at the end of the year, this month is going to be halfway through the year. So, yeah. Neither can I. Neither can I. Um, what is happening? <laughs> yeah. Well, we will be anxiously looking for those things. Um, for anybody who came later in the show and is new to Rosie, you'll find all of her. Um, you'll, I'm going to say that part later. But um, you mention the two books that you would recommend to people because a lot of people might not you know know where to start with you or whatever tell people the two books again that you would recommend for a low heat and high heat so for low heat i'd recommend the gift and uh, for high heat i'd recommend birthday shot um if you like to read series the gift is also probably a good place to start because that's the first book in a six book series following five siblings and just for a short synopsis of the gift the trope it's enemies to lovers and basically in this book yeah this is the caveat because there's some i feel as if i've listened to um a podcast where some persons were like absolutely not um but the the premise of the book is the lead female character maya agrees to be a surrogate for her best friend um, because she was unable to conceive. And uh, then the best friend dies, leaving her to be the surrogate while contending with the husband that she had hated for the entire marriage. And they do fall for each other. And I do understand that there's all, every time this book comes up, someone goes, I would haunt my best friend for the rest of their lives 
if they got with my husband. And my theory is kind of like, I'd be too busy being dead. Um, but um, so that's the caveat. Um, there's some people who are absolutely definitely not. But I think it was a sweet book. Um, I did cry a little when writing and rereading. And it's a good launch pad um, for the series. And then it also allows you to watch my writing get steamier and steamier and steamier <laughs> so that you're ready for birthday shot. But if you just want to go off the deep end for the steamiest, I think I've written thus far, there's Surrender, um, which is a friends to lover sort of trope where they promised each other one night together. If in No, it wasn't one night. It was probably more than one night. I think it was the weekend. If in 12 years, um, they were still single. Mm, that sounds that fun. will also <laughs> be in audiobook um, at the end of the month. I love it. All right. And I don't want to leave out Pam because we were when we were naming people, I said a little self-promotion. That I have two books, Leap of Faith and Valentine Love. So, <laughs> okay. So you told us what's coming up for you. Where can readers connect with you online, Rosie? I am on all platforms as Rosie Wright. Um, so that's Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. Um, you'll more likely see me on Twitter <laughs> than anywhere else, if I'm going to be honest. And the website is also realzywrites.com. But... I promise to be more um, consistent in the other platforms. But as it stands, not right now, I'm actually not doing quite well. So I've been a bit off of social media. But give me a week or two and you'll see more of me on Twitter. And then I'm going to try to at least publish on other platforms twice to three times per week. Someone on Facebook mentioned that I hadn't published anything on Facebook in a year and some. And I was like, you are absolutely right. Give me a couple of months. <laughs> get back to it. But Rosie writes across all platforms. I, love, I we appreciate the consistency as a reader and a fellow author. I appreciate that consistency. It makes you easier to find. So thank you. And thank you for being here. Because like, like, as you mentioned, you haven't been well. And so I we appreciate you taking the time to come and spend some time with us and hang out with us. So thank you. And again, um, Rosie's information, our Facebook page and her website is in the description for the show to make it easier for you to find her and, and, and connect with her on her different social media platforms because she's Rosie writes on all of those. <laughs> so thank you again for being here. And uh, we look forward to everything that you think that you're going to do the rest of this year and in the years to come. <laughs> thank you. And that was Rosie. Adams, who was joining us, um, got some great tips for her, for all of us, you know, for not only readers, but for writers, you know, because a lot of readers want to be writers, right? So, and, or for those of us who are writers and been writing for years, you know, I've, I'm always tweaking my process. So I love to hear other writers talk about what they've been through, what they've learned, what their processes are. Those are also useful to me. So I appreciate that. So if you enjoyed the show, by all means, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already and share the show so that other readers can find it. And again, to learn more about Rilzy, her information is in the show description. So you can uh, connect with her on social media and follow her as well. Don't forget to join me for my next chat on June 20th, Tuesday, June 20th, two weeks from today with Rebecca Weatherspoon. Uh, we're going to be talking about three reasons representation in teen romance is so important. And she has just released her first YA book. Um, so we're going to be talking about that. And for more author chats, if you like that, um, Brown Book Series by my friend Shay Baby. Uh, you can find the link in my favorites. You can find it to, to go to her channel. I think it's Wednesday at 7 
is that when she has her show live and she often does giveaways on the show and stuff. So you definitely want to join her there. Um, if just, she's also, her show is also a podcast. So you can catch her on Spotify and all those other places as well. And so thank you so much for joining us tonight. We appreciate having you here again. Don't forget to like subscribe and share. And if you have comments for Rilzy or for me, you can drop them on the show page and we'll address them as we were able to. Thank you again for being here. You all make the show, uh, you're, uh, you're engaged and you ask great questions and you have great comments and you make the show exciting for us as the for being here. Until next time. Thank <laughs> you.